Hello out there, everyone. Hi. Welcome to the musical Quarren Stream with Glenn and Bree. I am Glenn. I'm Bree. Seeing that ring light reflected in the glasses. <laughs> and the musical Quarren Stream is twice a week where we sit down with the internet and we talk about musicals and musical theater and drama and the arts and television. And we usually wind up with one of us pitching a show. Usually. Usually. I mean, haven't, haven't really failed yet. We have taken yeah. some time off here and there, but yes. we've been going since March. We'll probably keep going until the end of the year. Um, might change formatting again. We've changed format a couple times, but um, mm -hmm. we'll just see how everything goes. Yeah, but right now, the pitching a show is a part of uh, our format that we are regularly running. So, And hello, Bristol. Thanks for joining us in the chat room. Uh, always nice to see you guys join us. So, let's see. You're doing something. I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. I'm doing something today. And uh, we do usually take a few minutes to talk about, like, what's the... Oh. Sorry. I, you're not in the frame. You've got to be in the frame if you pitch in. Oh, yes, yes. I there do. we go. Yes, All there right. we go. All right. Crisis averted. Yes. <laughs> this is why I'm not the PA. Yeah. So we usually... I'm on screen count. <laughs> like you gotta be careful about the union moving lights around and things like that the union union will get you they will get me as long as they're wearing their masks yes all right but uh and they get you from six feet away at least so, <laughs> so. but but yeah so uh usually we talk a little bit about what are we watching what have we seen that's fun and stuff like that uh we've been watching the new season of infinity train very sad. Yes. Very sad season. Very good show. Very sad season. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of good cartoons on uh, HBO Max. Yeah. It's, which uh, is usually my first choice. I want to watch Lovecraft Country, but I don't like horror, so I keep telling Glenn whenever he gets a free moment again, he's going to have to watch it and then tell me if it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I could watch, like, I watched oh. True Blood. So if it's like that, yeah. you know, I could probably do it, but. It's always difficult because the thing that Brady really, really does not like in horror is body horror. So if it's like, you know, getting into gory, messy sort of stuff, that that's that's what Brie doesn't really care for in horror. Uh, and with TV shows, it can be difficult because, like, I started watching, uh, there's this great series, Channel Zero, which was a sci-fi original series. Mm -hmm. And I watched through most of the first season, and I was like, well, Bree would probably like this because this is more psychological thriller-style yeah, horror like and everything. Yeah, like Twilight zone yeah. and the stuff, like spooky. I've watched yeah. some episodes of Black Mirror. And then I got into the last two episodes of the first season of Channel Zero, and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, and there's the body <laughs> horror right there. So, <laughs> don't, like, Which is really funny because like, I work in a hospital, and I'm perfectly yes. fine with like hospital stuff and procedures and blood, but I think it's the whole, I don't like it when other people are hurt against their will. Yeah. I, mean, I don't like it when people are going through surgeries or shots or, you know, blood or mm -hmm. subcutaneous procedures. But I can do that because that's a little bit harmful, but it's like for a cure. Yeah. So, so um, but yeah, that that's sort of, you know, uh, Infinity Train is not a show like that. No, it's a cartoon. Uh, it's a cartoon. <laughs> it's but a one of the guys who created things like... Um, regular show and did some other yeah. stuff on Cartoon Network. And it's a very uh, weird science fiction fantasy sort of show. That's what it is. Yeah. The, basically, the uh, overall pitch mm -hmm. is if you have an issue that you don't know how to deal with, you get sucked into this um, basically almost like a computer type of program, except it's a big, long train. Yeah. And through ch going through different cars in the train, you're supposed to be able to understand why you feel the way you feel and how to resolve your problems better yeah and there's a lot of especially in the early seasons playing with sort of like video game tropes mm -hmm. and familiar video game things but uh it's i i highly recommend it it is a very wonderful uh science fiction weird weird stories kind of uh vibe to and it. each episode is only 15 minutes yes so if you 
if you watch the first episode and you don't like it, it's very quick to abandon ship. But uh, And let's see, I have not read it yet, but I have gotten a new play I'm very excited to start reading. Uh, the Doctor in Wonderland, which is published by Samuel French, published so published and represented for performance rights by one of the major play publishers in the United States. And it is a parody of Doctor Who, in which Dr. Watt and his companion Kara crash into Wonderland from Alice in Wonderland. This is basically <laughs> Baby Glenn's two favorite things yes. in a play. So yes. so technically it's young Glenn's three favorite things. Yes. I also suggested Glenn should start watching High Score on mm. Netflix, which is about the history of I yeah. think creating video games and stuff. Yeah, which I've been I've been seeing people talk about that and uh <laughs> We have these big water bottles because it's summer and we're all dying here in Virginia. It's very warm and humid. And so I was, like, going to try to surreptitiously take a drink. Um, but I screwed the cap on too tight. So now <laughs> I'm just going to very obviously take a drink as Ben finishes his story. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a, but it's a series of do uh, documentaries. Or it's a documentary. Is it a series? I don't know that much about it. I think it's, yeah. um, like, a series that has maybe six episodes yeah. that talk about a different facet of video games. Yeah, and... How they uh, were created. And the all. story that Brie saw where she was like, you have to see this, is uh, the inventor of the interchangeable cartridge for video game systems. Yeah. Uh, who, uh, who was a uh, young black man working in electronics at a time when it was still very much an older white guy industry. Yep, he was so. a very talented electrical engineer, and um, he's not in, well, he wasn't in the clips I saw, mm -hmm. but his kids and grandkids were talking about him and kind of how he came up with the idea and how he built stuff. And yeah. It seemed pretty neat. And it's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, not many systems use cartridges anymore, but interchangeable cartridge systems pretty much changed the way video games were played in the United States. And to the degree that it's hard to imagine what the industry would have been without them. And hello, Jenny. I see you popping up in the chat. Thanks for joining us. We're happy to see you here. Uh, so let's see. So there's documentary on Netflix, cartoon on HBO Max, play from Samuel French. Uh, anything else we want to... No, I'm still... I mean, to be honest, my uh, thing I look forward to every um, week is Thursday Infinity Train because I have to know mm -hmm. what the the mystery is. I want to I want to be able to see it being solved, mm -hmm. um, despite it being very sad. Like it. So this uh, this season is about like essentially like Nazis. Yes. <laughs> so it's really hard to yeah. deal with, but um, but yes, yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, the fungies or fun whatever they are. Uh, that yeah, was kind the of a cute little show. Um, that's on HBO Max as well, and um, it's. We when we first started watching it, we're like, oh, it's a it's a show who somebody had an idea for toys, and I'm yeah. like, I still want those toys, like they're really cool toys, um, but it's really just like the perfect show for quarantine <laughs> because there is literally this like one little tagline where they're ending the show and. Um, they went through this, like, catastrophic event in their town, and they're like, so, you know, little child out in the street, what have you learned today? And they're like, I learned that anything is possible because my parents love me, and I made friends with the chair. And I'm like, <laughs> if that is not what I say to myself every single day during quarantine, I don't know what is. These people <laughs> were, like, futurists. They predicted <laughs> where we were going to be. Um, so it's, it's really built for kids. It's really not mm. built for adults. It is a kid show. And I think most kids will just really enjoy it. It's all about, um, what do they say? Like inclusion and kindness and, you know, all mm. that fun stuff. So I feel like, you know, if you have kids, you want to watch it, but you know, even if you're just like, look, I just can't watch one more horrific piece of news. Again, it's really short little shows. They're real cute. Mm -hmm. So I like those two. And then um, I still really like puppet history. And I still yes. really like the Muppets. So I feel like all of my comfort food in the mm -hmm. middle of quarantine has been um, puppets, cartoons, um, pizza. Well, <laughs> like, well, I like all the things I liked when I was, you know, 12. So And there's something very fun about the fact that Friday is the day that puppet history drops new episode. Mm -hmm. 
a new episode every week on YouTube. And that's also the day that Muppets Now gets posted to Disney Plus every week. Yeah. So you can get like a double dose of puppetry and fun. Yeah, really just the first half of the week is hard. You know, yeah. it's like we get to Thursday and Friday, you can have some, you know, cute little cartoons as a distraction and cute little puppets that will mm. teach you something about history. Yes. But the first half of the week, it has to be John Oliver. Yes, John Oliver still really like that. Um, you know, I, I haven't really found anything. Like, I think the things that I'm kind of getting caught up on is I still like the PBS Digital mm -hmm. Studio pieces that we've talked about in the past. Um, I have watched some... Uh, other, you know, BuzzFeed or ex-BuzzFeed creators on uh, on their channels. And so I've been kind of watching that. Um, I haven't really gotten into much else. Like, I feel like I'm trying to make, like, a dessert a week now. <laughs> we have, like, peaches. And so right after this, I'm going to make a peach pie. That's, like, what's yes. weighing on my mind. Um, just really trying to get through stuff. What I think has been really hard this past week is I'll sit down to try to start something and then something breaks or... Some, somebody vomits or, you know, there like there just not, seems to be a lot of stuff going on. Not me. I have not been the one vomiting. We, we have cats. Um, I mean, better I, out than be. in, I always say. It, yeah. it could be me. Not that there's anything wrong with vomiting. I was like, you got very defensive. I was like, it's okay if you're <laughs> sick and you have to vomit. I didn't want people online to be like... Are you vomiting, Glenn? Do you feel okay? <laughs> He'd be in the hospital if he was. Yes, okay. yes. Um, and I think um, right now we're experiencing students coming back, so we're just a little nervous. And so I think kind of the uh, the more fun distractions where you can stay at home. Um, we have to go pick up groceries later. <laughs> yes. Um, I we still very worried about the post office. Um, yes. I. Made an order for a couple items, still haven't gotten here, and um, my medication still hasn't gotten here. So I think we're just, you know, yeah, our, uh, fight, fight in the real world. So I think going into cartoons and, and puppets are probably very pleasant. Yes. <laughs> our local movie theater sent us emails today, mm -hmm. not today, earlier this week, yeah. about how they're reopening. Like on Wednesday. Yeah, like on Wednesday, uh, about how they're reopening and all the steps they're taking to try to enforce social distancing and everything and it's i appreciate the lengths that they are going to oh yeah i appreciate the work they're putting into trying to make this work and my thing is whenever i see all of this stuff i'm like look i 100 percent understand i love movies i love going to movie theaters i want to sit in a movie theater and watch a movie I want to go out to a restaurant and get brunch and sit on the patio of the restaurant and all of that. But it does not matter how much I want it. That does not make any difference to the fact that this whole thing is still going on. The pandemic is still going on. And I can want to sit in a movie theater as much as I humanly can that's not going to make the movie theater safe to sit in. Yeah, I think um, the problem that I always have is I, I really believe that people are going to try to do the right thing. Like, I mm -hmm. like to believe kind of in the inherent goodness of people. Yeah. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of evidence to the contrary. But, you know, working in colleges for the past 20 years, like, I feel like people are getting a lot of mixed messages. Like, no, you can't be together in small spaces, but we're still going to put you with a roommate where both of you haven't seen each other in six months. And um, we're not really going to eliminate, you know, as, as many spaces as we can in the classroom. You know, we don't want to take a 300 person class and take it down to 100. So we're still going to try to put people all there. But if we all see you congregating outside together, that's automatic expulsion, or, yeah. you know. And I, I just feel like, you know, your brain doesn't stop growing <laughs> until 25. <laughs> and so I think people are really trying. And I said, you know, I could totally see myself as a theater major being like, I'm going to go out to the drill field and I'm going to put picnic blankets six feet apart from each other. And we are going to do a socially distanced performance to protest this socializing ban. And <laughs> I would have been real sassy about it. So yes. I just, I feel like there's no real good solutions. And I really like a petition that's been going around for our school in particular, like no acceptable loss of life, which I think is really important because like, we just don't, we don't know. 
Yeah. You know, I, I wish that there was just ways to, you know, kind of make everything kind of a, uh, a cost benefit thing. But, you know, I have a feeling like if I had to make this decision for, for me going back to school, as much as I loved being back, back at school, I think, you know, I, I grow up with a lot of health problems and I think it would be yeah. a really tough decision to stay home despite paying a large tuition on it, especially cause like I was out of state. They're not going to be like, Oh, well, you're not, not out of well, state. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of, a lot of issues surrounding it. That's very, very stressful. And we've already had a case of one student having to be socially isolated and people over in Fontaine research park and people over in endoscopy. So it's still here. You know, we, we might not have like New York numbers, but it's still here. And there's, you know, at least examples that we've seen here in, in our hospital of uh, veins and arteries turning brittle as glass, you know, not being able to put in very soft probes or, um, you know, injunctive procedures to save people because you're just breaking yeah. arteries. And, um, you know, we just don't, I, I just don't think that there's anything that has ever proven that's like that won't happen to an 18 year old. Yeah. You know, and it, it is. It's a very difficult thing because people act like, somehow people act like you can control who gets sick. Or, or if they get it, it won't be as bad. Yeah, and it's like, no, you don't, you don't control who gets sick. You don't control who has bad fallout from the disease. And even people who recover and become, quote unquote, perfectly healthy. We're getting lots of stories now of people who have recovered from the virus, you know, who have, they don't have the virus in their system anymore or anything like that, but they haven't gotten back their sense of smell. They haven't gotten back their sense of taste. Or even or, their energy level. Or their mm -hmm. energy level, that there's, they still feel exhausted. Uh, the mental issues that can result from the virus taking up residence in your nervous system, mm -hmm. Uh, we're seeing evidence that even when someone recovers from the virus, if it spent time in their nervous system, they still suffer from conditions related to that. Yeah, and I, I just feel like it's almost very much like an abstinence-only sex education type of talk. Yeah. Because, like, you know, we're getting a lot of messaging towards yeah. the students. Like, but you guys, you wouldn't be welcome at this university if you weren't really, really, really smart and if you weren't really, really, really kind. And I'm yeah. like, diseases don't care how smart and kind you are. Like, you know, I, I don't think that a anybody who is smart and kind would seek to get it, but still stuff happens. Yeah. And viruses like don't do like a, a morality test before infecting oh. people. And I just feel like, you know, we shouldn't punish college kids for trying their best and making mistakes because if we're successful, then the administration did everything right. And if we're unsuccessful, well, those college kids, you can't trust them, but they want their money. <laughs> well, and that's, that's the sort of thing that is kind of bothering me about where we are right now in terms of our pandemic response, mm -hmm. is that um, I drove under the banner on the UVA campus yesterday uh, that says, be safe for all of us. Mm -hmm. That's all it says, is be safe for all of us. And I just looked at that and I'm like, okay, what are y'all doing to help them be safe? Like, it sounds like, you know, when there when there's not things being done when you're not taking care of multiple occupancy in the dorms, when you're not taking care of class sizes, when you're not doing everything possible to make things available digitally uh, and by distance instead of making everybody come to the campus. It's like you are the ones making the situation where, thing, where things cannot be safe. And then you're hanging up banners everywhere telling people it's their responsibility to stay safe in the environment you have created for them. Well, and we talked about mixed messaging. Like, you yeah. know, I'm in an office of under 10, and technically we're all allowed to be there. If we yeah. all wear our masks when we're around each other, a gathering under 10 is fine. Um, but even we're talking about, like, maybe we should have 
these people come in on these days, these people come in on these days, and these people are just permanently until the virus is over, work from home. And, you know, I was talking about maybe being one of the work from home people because I have non-interventional trials. And um, that just basically means, like, I don't give people medicine. Like, there's no um, possible way, like, the research I'm doing is curing anybody. I'm at, like, very early stages. So mm -hmm. we're just trying to see um, what are people's genetic compositions for medicine. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my work is done online. And the problem with that is like, if I work at home, you know, we've been having rolling blackouts and rolling brownouts. Um, you don't really have the same type of security that you do on, on campus. Um, we don't really have the same type of fiber op optic networks for our phones and for our internet. You know, we're paying all that out of pocket. So I feel like, you know, even with us all working from home, there still is no motivating factor for people to improve our grid or our systems to make sure that we can work efficiently from home and not everybody is you know making tenured professor law school business school mm -hmm. surgeon money yeah. um and so it's really well, hard you know i i just don't see like there's a whole bunch of good solutions also in my office <laughs> i love my office don't get me wrong but we have like black mold <laughs> you know <laughs> so we kind of joke about like you know we're we're doing the best of what we can but we're kind of like putting things together with popsicle sticks and Elmer's glue right at this point. And I think that we're still doing pretty amazing and, and moving forward, but it has been really stressful on, I think everybody in my office and probably for a lot of other people in a lot of other offices as well. I can see why a lot of people took early retirement when all this hit. Um, and we all want to be there. We all want to help people. Like I really love my patients. I'm trying to figure out ways to do more research with psychosocial aspects of cirrhosis diagnoses and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. I, I mean, as much as I love my job, it's really changed in the past yeah. year. And I think that our, our very first thing that I'm very lucky enough that my supervisors and everybody supports it is how do we take care of each other because we need to keep going mm -hmm. like we need to live through this so we can get back to doing our studies that we always have so you know luckily you know we have a little bit of a slowdown and we're you know doing our best but it is still we love and support each other and we want us to all work really hard to help do that and sometimes it just seems like it's harder than usual yeah so hopefully yeah. everybody out there is doing okay as well but that's a little bit of what we're kind of experiencing so yeah. i feel bad because we don't have a lot of entertainment that we keep saying like hey here's the highlight of this entertainment but it, it, it's getting yeah. pretty serious the more we kind of live through this well, and i think we should just acknowledge it yeah and one thing that i wanted to throw into the conversation about the uh the sort of socializing of failure or privatizing of success uh, that we're seeing with the whole, like, if this, if everything works and we don't have a huge spike in the numbers, then that's all down to the organization did a great job. Mm -hmm. And if there is a huge spike in the numbers, well, then the students did wrong. Um, is that a lot of this that we're seeing is genuinely fallout from very early on in our shelter in place with people attempting to get some sort of assistance to say, you know, this is, this is very scary. This is something we all have to deal with. We just need some way that we can be assured we can all stay home, do the right thing, stop the virus from spreading and not be, ev and not be uh, evicted from our homes because of it, not lose our jobs because of it. Whether that was introducing like monthly payments to people to stay home during the pandemic, or whether it was calling a mortgage holiday and a rent holiday, or any number of options that were floated out there, people were saying, we need some kind of assistance for this. And the response was, oh, we know exactly what you need. We're going to pass a law that says that you can't sue companies and organizations if you get sick on their property. And that was that that was it. So now we see things like um, universities saying if students are caught at a party during this time, if students are having a party during this time, they'll all be brought before the college's disciplinary committee for possible expulsion. And it's like, well, that 
I understand the motivation behind why they're thinking that. There is no federal response in place to keep people from making mistakes like this. The states have made it clear in large part that they're not interested in enforcing any kind of regulation that would stop this. So the college is like, well, we've got to do something. And the biggest thing we have is the disciplinary committee. But it still feels wrong to put students into a position of, if you mess up, we will see to it that your academic career is tanked. Well, and it's just really hard to define what what do they mean by stuff mm -hmm. because I, you know, was very lucky. I was in a suite type of situation when I was mm -hmm. in college, which already means like, you know, there were six people in yeah. our suite. And then, of course, we knew the people across from us, which there are six people in their suite. So if like our six people sits in our suite, their six people yeah. sits in their suite and we have a pizza in the middle of the hall, like, is that a party? Are yeah. we in trouble? Like, you know. What, what constitutes a gathering <laughs> that you're going to be expelled for? That That's a very good question. And uh, it is, I, I feel like it is a thing where we all want to embrace the notion of nobody knew how to deal with all of this. We all want to embrace that notion of this was unprecedented, nobody had any good ideas, we're all just doing the best we can. But the fact remains that we do actually have, like, experts who gave us best practices and we have places in the world that we can see those worked. We have New Zealand where we can see that it worked. We have all these places around the globe that are able to start stepping through opening things up safely. Well I because remember they, everybody was mad about Wuhan China being able to be public and party yeah. and stuff but they've been clear for months. Yeah and, and it is it is one of those things uh, we I, I feel like it is important to acknowledge. And we'll move off of this soon enough and into my pitch because we're taking a long time on this today. But um, I feel it's important that we need to acknowledge that this was not a lack of knowledge. It was not a lack of planning. It was not a lack of experience. It was a lack of leadership that at the very top level, we had leadership that failed to actually move forward with this and do the things that everybody was saying needed to be done. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's like I, I feel like the another problem is, is, you know, really mishandling of money. Yeah. Like my mom oh, yeah. used to work for the IRS, and so we talk all the time, like, how when she left her job, uh, she worked there from the 1960s until early 2000s. And so she was there for like 45 years. And a lot of her role was, um, hey, everybody, <laughs> <laughs> you should pay your taxes. And this is what we're doing with your taxes. And even though nobody likes to pay their taxes, like this is what you're kind of getting for it. And this is why it's really important that we you know, crack down on people who try to evade their taxes and, you know, why people shouldn't have shell co companies. <laughs> mm. So she was really like the faith of the IRS. And in fact, like there is a documentary out there about people who tried to kill my mom. It was very scary. It's like the very first thing I Googled my mom's name, like when Google was like brand new. Mm -hmm. And that was like the first thing I, I saw is people were out there like who wanted to murder my mom. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's what happens when you're the mouthpiece for the IRS. Yes. Um, but, you know, she said there's really like nobody cares. Like nobody wants to do that. But it was really something that was created in the 60s. Because if you think of like JFK being like, hey, guys, like. We really need everybody to pay their taxes, otherwise how are we going to get to the moon? How are we going to like take care of like education in this country? How are we going to go ahead and make sure we have the scientists and the educators and everybody who we really need in the future to do the wonderful things we want to see in the future and, and progress as a, as a country? And uh, and that that has not been a thing since George W. Bush. Yeah, so. and that is, that, that is a very frightening thing, honestly, is that we do need somebody doing what your mother did at the IRS. It's a pretty constant thing, but see, if you have someone doing that sort of thing at the IRS, it's hard to convince people that the IRS doesn't do anything. Yep. So, but. But you know what? We're here to talk about theater. Well, I always feel like the first half is always the quarant, right? Yes. We're doing the quarantine stuff. We're talking about the disease. We're talking about how we're all getting through this pandemic. And then the second half is the musical stream. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, we started... 
this past Wednesday on our new theme. Uh, you might think that we're still talking about social issues because of the entire first half of the show. But we moved on from social issue, social topics, mm -hmm. theater, into literary adaptations, which we've done children's books before and things like that, but now we're doing more like broad literary sort of thing. Yeah, I think like we did children's books and biographies. Like we did a couple of things here and there. Like we're mm -hmm. basically moving through the stacks in the library and yeah. showing you kind of, you know, musicals not necessarily just a piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of different things that you can kind of adapt and, you know, make make into a great piece yeah. of art. And on Wednesday, Brie discussed one of the greats of early American feminist literature, I would say, mm -hmm. Kate Chopin, mm -hmm. uh, and a pair of silk stockings as a potential yeah. basis for a musical. And not that, like, I'm saying you had to do your homework, but I hope you read those four pages. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> it. And if you didn't, that's okay. I understand. Yeah. Last week was hard. Yeah. <laughs> And now, uh, today, it falls to me, and I am going to, um, I, I've, I have made a choice on who I am going to talk about that would make a lot of English professors facepalm following on Kate Chopin, because the person I have selected is John Kendrick Bangs. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I like John Kendrick Bangs, and it's not that he's a bad guy or he believes bad things or anything like that. It's that John Kendrick Bangs was a writer, an editor, and a humorist in 1920s America. So after you cover like the serious issues of Kate Chopin's work and her place in literature and everything, to turn around and be like, and here's a guy who wrote funny little stories about ghosts. <laughs> I can see a few English professors out there going, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> but... I do feel like he represents an area of American literature that is a lot of fun, that in many ways we've kind of forgotten in the modern era. Mm -hmm. um, because when you think of horror literature in the United States, um, pre-modern horror literature, you've got Edgar Allan Poe. So very... Very gothic, very... Who, like, went to school here. Yes. Very briefly. And I didn't tell you this, but, like, on Friday, I saw the biggest freaking crow. Like, yeah. it was, like, up to my waist. It looked like... <laughs> I was like, I totally see how he was inspired to write The Raven here. Yes. Um, <laughs> but you got some big corvids. <laughs> so you, you, you got Edgar Allan Poe. And you have H.P. Lovecraft. Um, both masters of the macabre and the bizarre and the eerie. And then I feel like you have John Kendrick Banks, John Kendrick Banks, who tells very good ghost stories. They genuinely are good ghost stories, but he's very lighthearted about the whole thing. <laughs> There's a very Mark Twain element to it, that uh, which I think is another thing that kind of got me thinking about John Kendrick Banks and his his body of work was that. Talking about American ghost stories and American horror stories, like we said, Poe, Lovecraft, and the area that Kendrick Bangs fits into in that literature, in that literature, is where people put Mark Twain and the Canterville Ghost. And it's sort of like, even the thing that John Kendrick Bangs was best at, somebody else is better known for it today than he is. Anyway, so... Um, like Don Knotts. Yes. <laughs> uh, hey. Everybody knows, you know, uh, Don Knotts movies. I think that that's exactly kind of what you're talking about. Is <laughs> they're real ghosts, but yeah. they're silly. Yes. In fact, that's actually a pretty good... The Ghost in Mr. Chicken <laughs> is an awful lot like the spirit of what you would see in a John Kendrick Banks story. Where it's a, it's a creepy ghost story. That's actually really good. I hadn't thought of the Don Knotts ghost movies. But yeah, because I had been thinking about, like, typically when you think of humor and ghosts, you think of, like, the Abbott and Costello meet the movies mm -hmm. that are more about the comedy than they are the scary story. But the Don Knotts ghost movies, that's a really good one. That's 
here's a ghost story, and we just stuck Don Knotts into the middle of it. That, I did my homework. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I really like that you pulled that out. That's great. Um, That's why we make a good team. <laughs> yeah. I always so, say, like, we're George Burns and Gracie Allen, except he has to be Gracie. Yes. Um, <laughs> but it, it's like... It's like, uh, what was it, George Burns said when he pitched the partnership to Gracie Allen. He was like, here's the idea. We'll get married, we'll go on the road together, we'll do funny stuff, and we'll split the money 60-40. And she said, all right, I'll agree to that, but only if we can say we're splitting the money 40-60 so it looks like my idea. <laughs> um... But yeah, so John Kendrick Bangs, very, very uh, 1920s sort of F. Scott Fitzgerald sound to his prose and everything like that, and loved to do things like, there's a ghost that walks these halls, and you can tell that he's coming by the sound of a bicycle bell. And there was a running series in his work of um, all of these great writers who were now members of a writer's club in hell. And all of these things. And I, I toyed with a lot of different ideas, like we were talking about on Wednesday for Kate Chopin, of like, how could I combine stories? How could I try to come up with something that's... And much like Brie, I ultimately settled on, there's just one story I genuinely want to do a show for. And John Kendrick Banks wrote a story called probably his most anthologized story called The Water Ghost of Harrowby Hall. And I'm like, this would be a fun thing to put on stage. All right. So basically, let me give you the rundown. The Water Ghost of Harrowby Hall is a woman who at the beginning of the story appears in the same room on the same night of every year she appears in the master bedroom at Harrowby Hall. And when she appears, she first appears as a damp spot spreading across the ceiling. And then slowly she rises up next to the bed in the bedroom, screaming and wailing as water drips down the walls. And basically by the time it describes how by the time she leaves at the end of the hour, the entire bedroom is basically a soggy mess. Um, and this happens every year. And as the story begins, one of the owners of Harrowby Hall decides, oh, you know what? I can beat this. We know when she appears in that room, I'm going to just not be in that room on that night. So I'm going to sit by the fire and enjoy like a cup of bourbon. And then we'll worry about cleaning it up in the morning. And just a few minutes into the hour, she rises up through the floor of the living room and is like, excuse me, what are you not doing in bed? <laughs> and like proceeds to ruin his bourbon and his fire and everything and completely destroy the, uh, the drawing room that he's sitting in. Because it turns out that she's not haunting the room. She's haunting whoever currently owns the house. All right. Now, what follows is a story of how this, this owner of Harrowby Hall does not survive to defeat the ghost. But it, what follows is a story that ultimately winds up with good old-fashioned American ingenuity defeats the ghost. You have, very, you have like this very clever multi-year run between her and one of the landlords of Harrowby Hall being like, uh, well, I've tried this thing to get rid of you this year. Well, that doesn't work. Okay, so next year I'm going to try a completely different plan until he lands on one that works. Mm -hmm. And it's very funny. It's very lighthearted, very silly. And you get this sort of very nice sort of romantic tension going between him and the ghost. Mm -hmm. That they're still very much enemies, but there's starting to be this mutual respect for how each of them works. Um... And one of the reasons that I especially think this would be a great musical is because the night that the water ghost appears in Harrowby Hall is the same night every year. 
Christmas Eve. It's a Christmas story. You love a Christmas story. Yes. <laughs> and you always need Christmas musicals. And you need Christmas musicals every year because you don't want to put up the Christmas musicals that were put up last year. So I'm like, you could have fun with doing this Christmas story between the landlord and the ghost. And I even imagine this is set in one of the sort of like, Harrowby Hall is supposed to be this American estate sort of thing. So like, like New England. Yeah, like New England money sort of thing. Connecticut. I could see, though, actually moving the story to make Harrowby Hall one of the great, like, British estates. And then the main character who uh, ultimately has to encounter the ghost winds up being, like, the American cousin who was fifth in line for the earldom and nobody knows who he is. So like a little bit of a Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Yeah, a little bit of Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, a little bit of King Ralph, whatever your whatever your uh, cultural context is, yes. A um, little bit of me and my girl. But it's, uh, I can see setting up the story of the fish out of water American dealing with Christmas. And I could see setting this up as either multiple years of the story. Or altering the story a little bit to say she doesn't just appear for one night out of the year. She appears for the 12 nights of Christmas. And then making the musical all take place during those 12 nights. Um, and I think you have a lot of opportunity. You have a lot of opportunity to explore the ghost and why she's haunting Harrowby Hall. You have a lot of opportunity for fun duets between the characters and that sort of thing. And you have a lot of opportunity for, like, characters like the servants in the house who have gotten really used to, and then through this day, through this day, we'll have to replace the flooring, and <laughs> like, oh, don't mind me, I'm just moving the good painting out for tonight, you mm -hmm. know, sort of thing. Now, did you look and see if there was anything already kind of, like, created based on this? Uh, Harrowby Hall, I, you know what? I have not done the research on this. I encountered it, like I said, it's been very much anthologized. Um, but I also encountered it as there was a short, like, comic book story done based on it. Mm -hmm. And now that you have said that, let's go and take a look on <laughs> everybody's favorite source, Wikipedia, to, uh, to see what we could find you here. Can't. Lola has been trying to jump up on the couch or on this table for like the past 10 minutes and I kept trying to like navigate that and of course the one time I was not looking then she's like now I claw up your leg. Yes. So now she is sitting just off camera being very proud of herself. Yes. She, she is very happy to have gotten up here where she is not. Lola is not our cat who chews cables. Uhura chews cables. But Lola has decided that she really, really loves the cable that runs from the ring light. So we have to watch her around that. Yep. It's always something. I don't know. Whoever has pets, mention your favorite thing your pet does during work from home. You can feel free <laughs> to tweet at us. You can feel free to mention it in the YouTube comments. You can feel free to mention it in the chat here. <laughs> I know we all got some really lovely pets. And I know that as much as we love them, they're either loving or hating this whole work from home, stay at home order. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of my favorite thing. I love seeing all the uh, professor syllabi where they're just saying like, look, if you're at home and, and you want to have your dog come sit in class, that's fine. <laughs> so if there has been a thing made, it is not popular enough that Wikipedia has it. Which think? Wikipedia has some pretty obscure things selected. Yeah. So um, I feel fairly confident in saying, let's move forward. With I mean, it just seems like, you know, the only reason why I had an idea to even mm -hmm. ask was because it seems so obvious. Yeah. Because, like, we've already talked in the past, like, how we think, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas or Hocus Pocus would be kind yeah. of those good Halloween to Christmas movies. Well, and I feel like, this is part of what I talked about, that Bangs was not... Hi. Bangs was not unknown in his time. Yeah. Um, 
and I said 1920s, but more more honest, more accurately, he would have been like early 1900s would have been when he was at his peak for writing. Um, but he is not someone who is the first name on everyone's lips when they think about that era of writing or this kind of story now. Yes. So I think that it's a, I think it, I think it's an under-adapted work that a new adaptation would be a lot of fun and would probably catch on. So I think that the water ghost of Harrowby Hall, that's, that, that is a, that is a thing that I am saying if anybody wants to like, Pay me money to write this play. I'm probably going to write it anyway, but if anybody wants to pay me money to write this play, then they can go ahead and pay me money. I won't mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, we certainly won't want, mind any yes. money. And just to... They, they describe it much better than I did uh, on from Wikipedia, talking about his series earlier of the writers in hell. Uh, that is referred to as his Associated Shade series <laughs> because the associated shades are the ghosts who inhabit this gentleman's club in hell and the gentleman club or although he uses the term Hades <laughs> uh, and the club includes several famous people in particular Adam of Adam and Eve and the Baron Munchausen <laughs> But most of the members are popular writers, including Homer, Confucius, Shakespeare, President Walter Raleigh, Johnson and Boswell, and many others. So I think that that is, if The Water Ghost of Harrowby Hall turns out to be a huge success, I feel like you have more material to move on to there. Yeah. <laughs> maybe this is your thing. Like some people, like all they adapt is check off. Maybe this is your thing. <laughs> All right. So. But what do you think? <laughs> Go ahead. Feel free to tweet at us. Feel yes. free to uh, talk about kind of your, your favorite uh, mm. adaptation you might like to see. Maybe we can talk about one of your suggestions. We do have some plans, but we're always welcome to, uh, to hear stuff from the audience and yeah. try to uh, move forward next week. And maybe mm. if you mention something, like, that could be featured. Yeah. If we got if we got to be here until January, folks, we got a lot of episodes we need to do. We would always love um, your participation and your suggestions, mm -hmm. and uh, to talk about musical yeah. theater with you. Yeah, you, you know what? If we're here through January, maybe I'll just write this show and we can present it on the stream one day during the Christmas season. Yeah, that would be fun. Hello. Hi. Hi. You got to get her in frame more. There Jeez. you go. <laughs> She's just sitting right at the she's edge right of the here. computer. <laughs> so she's here. She's been here the whole time. She just was like, no, I don't want to be on camera. Yes. And we keep telling her that Cats is already a musical. We, we can't do Cats. Yes. <laughs> and she just wants us to know right now that we did not, in fact, send an appearance fee to her agent. So we <laughs> will be hearing from her lawyer. And even if you're here for Lola, you can feel free to tweet at us and say, you just want to see more Lola. We can yes. try to make the kitty cat show happen. Yes. Her appearance fee is very high, but we think we think we might be able to swing it. <laughs> but we love all of you. We're so glad that you guys joined us this Saturday. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some more things to share next week um, in the entertainment realm as we kind yes. of move forward into the fall. I feel like a lot of shows and a lot of things are taking a little bit of breaks now. But um, if things go well, you know, we were talking about how much we would enjoy seeing and doing more things. But we're going to wait that 14 to 21 days just to... Really make sure that everything's safe. But we love you. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe out there. <laughs> Don't eat wires. Don't do it. <laughs> like I was expecting her to grab the wire. I wasn't expecting her to start trying to wolf it down. No. All right. Love you guys. Stay safe out there. Take care of yourself. Because, you know, we are not there to take care of you. Bye. Bye, Bye Jenny. Bye, Bristol.